my name is Matt Anderson. I'm the curator of history here at the Sioux City Public Museum. And today we're going to talk about uh, the Sioux City wholesale grocery business and uh, specifically about the, the coffee roasting, packaging, and distri redistribution uh, business that they were involved with. Uh, it, it, uh, it, it is probably not well known to most people, that, but, but for about 100 years between the 1870s and 1970s, uh, Sioux City was, was the major wholesale grocery uh, distribution point for, uh, for a territory that uh, included east, northwestern Iowa, uh, southwestern South Dakota, all of south, or southwestern Minnesota, all of South Dakota, uh, up into uh, North Dakota, a lot, almost all of Nebraska. Uh, and so Sioux City really was a point where uh, products were, were shipped to and then redistributed uh, to the uh, smaller cities and towns in, in, the, uh, in the Great Plains region. Uh, and so and this was a huge component of, of, of the local economy. Uh, and the grocery business was, was ju just one of the very biggest components of this, of this wholesale trade. Uh, and then as we'll see, the, uh, the, the uh, coffee uh, roasting and packaging business was, was a big part of that. Uh, now you may say, uh, why, why coffee roasting? Why, what's, the, what's the interest in this? Well, right now we have, a, we have an exhibit uh, displaying a, a collection of, of vintage coffee tins and other memorabilia. Uh, some of it's from the Sioux City uh, Public Museum's collection. Some of it is from a local collector, specifically uh, John Gray, and then our own uh, archi archivist, uh, Tom Munson, uh, and so we have we have a really nice selection of of coffee memorabilia. Uh, th there's there's many reasons this is this is a popular area to collect. Uh, for one thing, uh, uh, coffee tins have really nice lithographic uh, artwork on them that people are attracted to. The other thing is people like coffee, and so kind of like uh, uh, beer cans and beer bottles and things like that. Certain types of packaging are attracted to collectors. Uh, and the and the other thing is it's it's an interesting notion that there were these regional uh, coffee brands uh, that uh, were really important uh, prior to uh, the, the post-World War II era. Uh, so the first person we want to talk about is Charles Brune, uh, and in many ways Charles Brune is the uh, uh, kind of the father of this uh, of this story. Uh, Charles Brune was a was a German immigrant uh, and a Civil War veteran. Uh, he opened a shoe store in Sioux City in 1866, uh, but then in 1871 he went into the the, the grocery business and his uh, his business expanded rapidly. And by the 1880s he was not only a retail grocer but a wholesale grocer. Uh, and one of the things that he was really well known for was was his uh, Brune's Pure Coffee. And here before we get too far of the story, we need to talk about coffee itself. So coffee is uh, a product that originated on the Arabian Peninsula. Uh, it became popular uh, in the in the uh, in the, the 15th, 15th century, uh, and it is to this day pretty well only grown in the equatorial region. So it is grown throughout South Asia into Southeast Asia, uh, in in South America, some of Central America. But that that is the area it grows on a on a, a shrub or, or a small tree, uh, and it requires the, the the type of climatic conditions uh, that uh, uh, that are, is only found in that part of the world. Uh, and so coffee has to be imported. Now for for a wholesale grocer, uh, you could always buy Roasted and and uh, and ground coffee, uh, but and cut co or co cut coffee, uh, but it was more economically uh, beneficial to the grocer if he did that work himself, bought the raw beans, uh, and then did the roasting and the repackaging and then the distribution himself. And so, uh, Brune was one of the early people here in Sioux City to realize that, and uh, his Brune co uh, pure coffee was kind of known as Sioux City's coffee in in the late 1800s, and we have a great uh, uh, a great tin here showing the, uh, uh, the lithography that was used on, on the packaging at that time. Uh, here we have a real early picture of, of this was actually when Brune was still in the in the shoe business. Uh, the photo from 1869. Uh, his 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 original store was at what was called 55 Pearl Street. Uh, that later became 407 Pearl Street. 
Uh, and so that it became his shoe business or his uh, his grocery business in 1871. Uh, and for those of you that remember when the museum had its Pearl Street Research Center, where we had our archives for, for many years, uh, that is the location where Charles Brune's uh, grocery store was over on Pearl Street. And, and the, the building that, uh, that we'll see here in a minute uh, stands to this day uh, in, in slightly changed form. So here we have a picture of, of Brune's store at 407 Pearl Street in, in 1890. Uh, now the building as it stands today has a different facade that was probably put on in the early 1900s or the 19 teens. Uh, but this is, uh, this is the way the, the storefront would have looked. Uh, you can see the black arrow pointing to the top of the store. And so that was his, uh, that was his grocery business right next to the Weir and Allison Bank. Here we have uh, Brune's storefront. Uh, now, in, in the in the 19th century, early 20th century, grocery stores were were usually uh, um, mostly dealt in what was called dry goods. So these were uh, things like coffee, sugar, canned products, uh, things that didn't go bad in 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 very quickly. Now you can see here in in Brune's business. Uh, he also was dealing in some uh, uh, some vegetables. That, you know, you have some potatoes, you have some onions, you have some different uh, uh, vegetables that he had displayed out there. So he was probably acquiring those locally. Uh, but it, it, at that time, a lot of times that part of the business was was dealt with by what was called the green grocer, uh, and so uh, and and the meat would have been dealt with by the by the uh, by the butcher. And so uh, the, the the grocery business was was very divided up compared to what it is today. It really Really wasn't uh, until after World War II that the modern idea of the supermarket uh, took off. Even though uh, the basic concept of that goes back earlier, uh, so so I think you get a sense of how uh, big uh, Brune's business was in that he was he was dabbling in some of the green grocer business uh, outside of his uh, main store here in Sioux City. Now the next person we want to talk about is William Tackaberry. Uh, now, William Tackaberry was born in Canada, uh, and he came here uh, to Sioux City in 1878 uh, and formed a wholesale grocery business with Robert Van Kieran and John Floyd. Uh, and so the, the original business was known as Tackaberry, Van Kieran, and Floyd uh, between 1878 and 1884. Uh, later, Tackaberry became known for the Tack uh, Cut brand coffee. And here we have a, a tin from the 19 teens that, that you see that. And again, uh, you, you have a catchy name uh, and then uh, the, uh, the, the, the cool lithography that was, uh, was characteristic of that time. Now these tins uh, were mostly manufactured after 1901 by the uh, American Can Company, uh, which was a huge uh, uh, agglomeration of, of dozens of, of tin manufacturers around the country. And so uh, it, it, uh, it, a lot of the, the vintage tins that you'll find for various products were, were made by the American Can Company. A lot of times they'll say Can Co on the bottom of them. Here's a picture of uh, Tackaberry Van Kieran and Floyd's warehouse uh, in the late 1870s, early 1880s. Uh, this building was on the east side of Pearl Street between 2nd and 3rd Streets. Uh, and, and you can see at this point, uh, Pearl Street was still, it hadn't been paved, it was still a, a, a mud street. Uh, but this, a lot of the wholesale concerns were right along between 2nd and 3rd Street because the, the original railroad line that came into Sioux City came right along what today what, what is 2nd Street, where, where the railroad passes through downtown today uh, would be approximately where 2nd Street is today. Now, in 1884, Tackaberry took pretty much sole control of, of the business, renamed it uh, William Tackaberry and Company, uh, and moved into a larger warehouse at 312 Pearl Street. So 312 Pearl Street uh, would have been on the east side of Pearl, about in the middle of the block between uh, 3rd and, and 4th Street. So he's kind of on the alley, on the, on the uh, uh, no, what would have been the north side of the alley uh, between 3rd and 4th. Uh, and so much larger building, uh, a brick building this time, uh, three stories. And so you get a sense of the expansion of, of the Tackaberry's business. And of course, this period when Sioux City's growing uh, fairly rapidly, and so is its trade territory, especially to the west. And so that would remain uh, Tackaberry's uh, warehouse until 1896. At that point, uh, Tackaberry moved moved actually almost exactly one block east uh, to to the east side of, of Douglas Street, 
uh, between 3rd and 4th Street. Uh, and so this would have been, this building would have been on the north side of the alley on Douglas Street, on the east side of Douglas Street between 3rd and 4th. It was the former PV Brothers Hardware uh, Company building. Uh, and so a little bit larger quarters uh, to, to, to accommodate the expansion that the Tackaberry uh, Company had gone through. And I have attached to the slide also a, a fun little advertisement for tack cut coffee from the early 1900s uh, using the, the uh, chicken uh, logo that, that they used for quite a few of their products. They used tack cut was coffee and then they used tack co uh, for, for all kinds of different, uh, for canned vegetables and things like that. So finally in uh, 19, so first off in 1901, the, the company was renamed William Tackaberry Company. They removed the and from the name. Uh, and in 1904, they moved into the uh, former Toller Tollerton and Stetson warehouse, uh, which was it, most of the building fronted uh, at 205, 209 Pearl Street. But this was actually an L-shaped building that fronted on both Pearl Street and 2nd Street. Uh, and in, on the corner then was, a, was an older brick building called the Sawyer's Block. Uh, so that, that, uh, that's, it really was both a, a, a building on, on 2nd Street and on, on Pearl. Uh, so here, here we have what the, the facade would have looked like in the, in the early 1900s. Uh, William Tackaberry uh, Sr. Uh, passed away in, in uh, uh, or retired from the business in 1914, uh, and his son, William E. Tackaberry, uh, took control of the company uh, at that point. And, he, uh, and William, Tack, William E. Tackaberry oversaw a major expansion of the building beginning in 1916. Uh, the the main the, the kind of centerpiece of this expansion was the construction of a new warehouse. Uh, it was at the northwest corner of Third and Wall Street, and this this building still stands to this day. Uh, Wall Wall Street be, is Floyd Boulevard today, and you can see on the on the right side of this picture the the what what today we'd call the Floyd uh, Boulevard viaduct uh, running by the building. So that gives you a, a, an idea of what we're looking at here. The in we're, we're on the third street side of the building, uh, looking to the to the northeast, and so this was a major expansion of the of the building, uh, of the business, uh, and so this is where Tackleberry operated from 1916 to 1924, uh, and of course part of this was to the the the, the uh, food processing uh, part of the the business grew, uh, which included the coffee roasting and and uh, grinding and, and activities like that. Here we have a great picture of the interior of, of that building uh, from the late 19 teens and you can see the products on the shelves and some of the storage bins in front of the workers here. Uh, the, you can see the uh, spiral uh, chute that products could be uh, shot down from higher levels of the building. Uh, and so, so these were, this is a, a great example of the old uh, wood frame warehouse buildings that uh, line Third Street here in Sioux City. Now, in 1924, William E. Tackaberry uh, decided to, to close the business. I'm not entirely sure why this occurred. There was a pretty severe uh, recession after World War I in the early 1920s, uh, and it's possible that the, the, that had something to do with it. But, but uh, Tackaberry went out of business in 24, and a lot of its uh, brands, especially uh, Tack Cut Coffee, went to it, local rival Tollerton and Warfield, as we'll see later. Uh, now, the, the next major figure we have to talk about is Conrad Schenkberg. Uh, Conrad Schenkberg was uh, a German immigrant. Uh, he came to Sioux City in 1882 with his business partner, James uh, Hovey, uh, and they went into the wholesale business with William Higman, who had act actually already been operating here in Sioux City for some time. So the first, uh, the first business or form of the business was called Higman, Schenkberg, Hovey & Company uh, for the first couple years of his existence. Uh, here we have a, a, a great tin of, of Shankberg's uh, Honeymoon brand coffee. Shankberg had all kinds of brands of coffee. The Honeymoon was one of the big ones, uh, we'll, but we'll see others as, as we go along, like uh, Saturday, Saturday Evening Host uh, and uh, a couple of others. Now, here we have a picture of the original uh, Shankberg warehouse. Uh, it was at the northeast corner of Third and Pearl Streets. Uh, so, 
and so we're kind of looking right. Third would be on the left and, and uh, Pearl on, on the right in this photo. Uh, this photo was taken later after it had become the Palmer uh, uh, Fruit Company uh, building in, in, the, in the 1890s. But you get a sense of just the, the busy, busyness of, of the uh, business with all the products out on the, on the street front. And uh, uh, it's a great scene of, of action here. So in, in 1883, uh, Conrad Shankberg took uh, full control of the company and renamed it C. Shankberg and Company. Uh, and also moved the company to a larger warehouse uh, at 309 uh, uh, Pierce Street. So 309 Pierce Street would be on the, uh, uh, on the west side of, of Pierce between 3rd and 4th, so kind of on the alley uh, in, in the middle of that block. Uh, and we'll, we'll see this building in, in uh, later picture uh, photos that, that uh, we'll come across. Uh, this became part of the, the Shankburg uh, complex uh, that, that occupied a basically the whole south half of, of that block between uh, Pierce and Douglas Street, north of 3rd. Uh, we also have a, uh, a picture of, of a, a uh, tin for, for Shankburg Saturday Evening Host Coffee. So this is another one of their uh, major uh, coffee brands. Of course, making a play on the popular publication, the Saturday Evening Post. Uh, so th that's a little play on words that Shankburg was engaging in there. Uh, now, after in, in later years, after a larger warehouse was constructed to the south of this building, it became the candy factory for, for Shankburg. And so, again, this is another example of how the wholesale grocery business here in Sioux City developed into uh, more of a, a processing and uh, repackaging business as well. Here we have a picture of the, the new, uh, very large uh, Shankburg warehouse that was constructed in 1892. So this would be at the, uh, the northwest corner of 3rd and Pier Streets. Uh, you can see the, the uh, 309 Pier Street uh, building abutting the new structure uh, to, on, on the right. Uh, and also at this point, uh, the, the company was, the and was removed and it became the C. Shankburg Company uh, from, from that point on. Uh, so the new the new uh, the new building was uh, four stories. Later it was six stories, as we'll see, uh, and it was also used by the Shankberg Company's successors, Moore Shankberg and and the O.J. Moore Company uh, until 1935. And at that point, it was converted into one of Sioux City's first parking ramps and was used as a parking ramp, uh, I believe, into the the 1970s. Uh, so. It, uh, it, it had a it had a long and varied career as a, as a structure here in Sioux City. Uh, one of the things that uh, Shankberg did around this time to expand the, the coffee roasting and packaging uh, part of his uh, business was they, he purchased the former Jacob Franz uh, brewery, which was at at that time it was called the, the Northwest it was the northwest corner of West Third and Elm Street. So Elm Street basically ran roughly where Wesley Way does today. And so uh, the, the location of this uh, brewery that I have circled in red uh, was kind of right on, in, in the area where Wesley Way passes uh, to the west of, of the uh, Hard Rock Casino today. Uh, that, that's roughly the, the area we're talking about. Uh, and we have a great uh, storage bin, uh, a picture of that, that actually says it's called Empire Coffees, uh, referring to the Empire Mills. Uh, and and uh, it, it does say in smaller print, Empire Mills, uh, on, on the uh, little columns that, uh, that you see on the, in the lithography. Now here we have a picture of the Shankburg warehouse after the top two stories were added uh, around 1904, 1903, 1904, that, that was done. And so uh, you can see how the, the, the business was expanding at that point. I uh, also have a great photo of Conrad Shankburg, who's on the, the older man on the right, and his protege, Oliver Moore, who's on the left. Uh, and Moore joined the Shankburg firm in 1892 and eventually uh, became a, an important company officer, secretary, and treasurer, uh, and eventually purchased the building itself, or the, the business itself. Now, here we have after uh, Oliver Moore uh, took control of the Shankburg Company and renamed it Moore Shankburg Grocer Company in 1916. Uh, he was born in Minnesota and, and proved to be a, a very uh, 
a debt business manager. Uh, one of the things that uh, Moore was known for was developing what was called the cash and carry uh, grocery business. And the idea of that was instead of, of his company uh, shipping the, the, the uh, groceries out to the small uh, grocery stores, that the owners of those stores would actually come to Sioux City and just purchase them and haul them themsel themselves back to, to the town where they operated. And so it was, it was a cheaper way to do business. And so he was known for that. Uh, I've always loved this uh, photo that, that we're seeing here because you see the original warehouse in, in the middle with two uh, transfer trucks, electric powered uh, transfer trucks. So the, 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 you, these would be battery powered uh, vehicles that were designed to haul the uh, groceries that were sent in on the railroad and then into the warehouses and then maybe from the warehouses back to the railroad or, or some other means of distribution. Uh, the other great thing about this photo is it shows the second uh, uh, Shankburg warehouse that was constructed in 1910 and that's on the far left that has the black arrow pointing down down to it. That was a 10-story warehouse uh, or an eight-story warehouse uh, that was constructed in 1910. And so you can get a sense of how big the Shankburg and then the Moore business uh, had become by, uh, by the mid-19-teens. So here's a picture of later when, in 1920, um, Moore renamed the company uh, O.J. Moore Grocer Company, and it operated under that name until 1935. And we have a, 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 another uh, version of Honeymoon Coffee uh, from the, the late 19-teens, only this time uh, put out by the Moore Shankberg Company. And then below that, we have a cardboard box of uh, Moore's 1855 brand coffee uh, from the from the mid 1920s, and so you have different kinds of packaging coming in. You have the tins, and now you're getting some cardboard boxes uh, for for distribution as well. Uh, this is a, a picture that shows the 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 kind of the complex after it became the O.J. Moore. Uh, grocer company. You can see home of Honeymoon Coffee, so that goes to show you that the Honeymoon brand was an important regional brand uh, for uh, the Moore company. Now, uh, O.J. Moore himself uh, passed away in 1928, and his son James Walmore took control of the company and operated it until 1935. And at that point, the company seems to have succumbed to the Great Depression. So the, the early to mid-1930s were a real tough time economically, and the, the, the Moore Company seems to have been a victim of that. Now, our next uh, major firm is uh, um, the Tollerton and Stetson Company, uh, which began in 1885. It was created by Oscar Tollerton, who uh, was born in Ohio, uh, and, and then Al, his partner, Albert Stetson, uh, who was, was born in Illinois. Uh, they came to Sioux City in 1885 and purchased the wholesale grocery business of uh, Edward Palmer and Company, uh, and they uh, and then turned that into perhaps Sioux City's largest wholesale grocery, certainly longest lasting and, and most far reaching uh, wholesale grocery business. So here we have, we saw this building earlier. Uh, it was one of uh, the, the Tackerberry Company's uh, warehouses, but it was actually constructed as the first uh, Tollerton and Stetson warehouse, uh, 205, 209 Pearl Street. This is the L-shaped building that also uh, fronted on, on 2nd Street, uh, farther, farther down the line to the west. Uh, and so this was their warehouse from 1885 to 1901. In 1901, uh, Tollerton and Stetson constructed a, a massive uh, new warehouse uh, at the southwest corner of 3rd and Nebraska Streets. And so here we get a, a sight of that. Uh, so this picture, we're looking to the southwest, and so uh, Nebraska Street would be kind of running on the left uh, of this picture and 3rd and Street on, on to the right. Uh, the other figure we see in this picture is William Warfield Sr., who we'll talk about uh, later. Uh, William Warfield Sr. was already operating in Sioux City uh, at the head of a, a company called uh, Howell and Warfield, and then later Warfield Pratt and Howell. Uh, and he, but he purchased a stake in Tollerton and Stetson in 1901 and helped finance the construction of the new warehouse. And in 1905, he took control of Tollerton uh, and Stetson and renamed it Tollerton and Warfield. Uh, and so now uh, William Warfield Sr. 
lived in Quincy, Illinois, and really never lived in Sioux City itself, uh, but, but he had major Sioux City business interests. Uh, here we have a picture of the Tollerton Warfield Warehouse, uh, which is on the left hand of this, uh, this picture with the black arrow pointing down on it. Uh, the, the large warehouse across the street on, on the right side of this was the Knapp and Spencer Hardware Warehouse. And so these were two Sioux City landmarks for, for many decades of these two big warehouses on, at 3rd and Nebraska Streets. Uh, we also have a, a picture of uh, a Tack Cut brand uh, coffee produced by Tollerton Warfield. So we've seen the uh, Tack Cut brand uh, uh, that was created by uh, the William Tackaberry Company. Uh, when Tackaberry went out of business in 1924, Tack Cut became, coffee became a brand of Tollerton and Warfield. And so here we have a, uh, an example of that. Now, Tollerton and Warfield was a really innovative business. They, they uh, dealt in the wholesale groceries, but they also expanded into other lines of food production and packaging. One of their early subdivisions was the Johnson Biscuit Company, uh, which was formed as a division of Tollerton and Warfield in 1907. Uh, and we'll, we'll see other examples of this. So in Johnson Biscuit, it's became a major Sioux City institution uh, and eventually uh, evolved into Interbake Foods, which still operates to this day in, in North Sioux City, uh, South Dakota. Here we have a great interior shot of the Tollerton Warfield Warehouse uh, at 3rd Nebraska. So you get a sense very much like the uh, the Tackaberry Warehouse we saw earlier, these big wood frame uh, warehouse uh, buildings for, that were used in the wholesale grocery business. We also have a picture of William Warfield Jr. So this is William Warfield Sr.'s son. Uh, and he actually came to Sioux City and lived in Sioux City. And so he was really the Sioux City uh, rep, you know, person based in Sioux City for the Warfield family. Uh, he replaced his father as the president of, of uh, Tollerton Warfield in 1916 and launched a, a big expansion project, much like William Tackaberry's, uh, or William Tackaberry's uh, son, William E. Tackaberry, did for that company around the same time. One of his big early innovations was the Council Oak system of grocery stores, which was a really early grocery store uh, chain, uh, not only in the, in the Midwest, but really in the United States. It was one of the earlier ones that uh, was developed. So let's talk a little bit about the Council Oak stores. Uh, here we have a, a great catalog from 1913 uh, that, that it, it was really the Tollerton Warfield catalog they called the Council Oak. Uh, and this was, I, th I believe, an attempt by Tollerton Warfield to uh, compete with things like the Sears catalog or the Montgomery Ward catalog uh, that were based in, in places like Chicago. Uh, Tollerton Warfield wanted to, to give that same type of mail order service to uh, in its trade uh, territory. So that Council Oak name was used for, for their trade catalog. And then in 1916, it began to be used for their system of grocery stores. And here we have a map from the uh, early 1950s, when by that point, there were over 90 Council Oak stores in, in, the, uh, in basically the Siouxland region in you know, uh, northwest Iowa, southwest uh, Minnesota, into uh, South Dakota, southeast South Dakota, uh, northeast Nebraska. Uh, and so th these became a, a major fixture in the small towns in, in the Sioux City area. And so I have a, a few pictures of the various Council Oak stores around Sioux City. Uh, this was a Council Oak store at 824 South Cecilia Street. So this is right where Morningside Avenue and JA Avenue uh, in South Cecilia meet uh, in, in Morningside. Uh, today it is uh, uh, occupied by the Shaquin Peterson uh, chiropractic. Uh, practice today, so uh, it, it's still being used, just not as a grocery store. Uh, here we have uh, the, the Council Oak store that was at 414 20th Street. So this would be uh, on the south side of 20th Street uh, to the west of, of Pierce Street. Uh, and today it's occupied by Pops Lounge, so it's just to the west of where the 20th Street Tavern is uh, at 20th and Pierce. Uh, so this was a, a, an early Council Oak store. Here we have a, a downtown uh, Council Oak store uh, at 624 Pierce Street. So this would have been at the southeast corner of uh, 7th and, and Pierce Street. There were actually, at various times, three Council Oak stores on Pierce Street. One downtown, one kind of in the middle uh, at, around 14th Street, and then another one up in the area where uh, Unity Point Hospital is today. This one has been uh, demolished and is a parking lot today. 
Now we have a, a, a small Council Oak store that was at uh, 1920 Virginia Street. So this would be the uh, it'd be the southeast corner of 20th and Virginia Streets, and this this building is still standing. I'm not sure what it's being used as. Uh, uh, it might be being used as a, a, a small business of some type. Uh, we also have a picture of uh, Tollerton Warfield's Morning Light Coffee from the. Uh, in, a, in paper packaging, in a paper bag uh, from, from the 1940s. And so this is example, another form of packaging being used in the, in the coffee business. Here we have the, uh, a Council Oak store that was at 27 and a half Pierce Street. So this would have been uh, on the uh, west side of, of Pierce, uh, right in the area where the uni main Unity Point Hospital building is today. Uh, but it was, it was uh, been demolished many years ago. And another uh, one of the Council Oak stores, 501 Pearl Street in the building that's called the Malone Block. Uh, at it, This would be the northwest corner of uh, 5th and Pearl Streets. Uh, today it's Pearl Street, used by Pearl Street Plumbing uh, as, as their business or as their building. Here we have another one of the Pierce Street, uh, uh, Council Oaks, 1311 Pierce Street. Uh, this this uh, building was has been demolished and it's occupied by the uh, building that houses the Sioux City Conservatory of, of Music today. Uh, we have another uh, picture of some, some bagged coffee. This one made by Tollerton and Warfield specifically for the Council Oak uh, stores called Council Oak Blend Coffee. So uh, at that point, uh, you know, by the 1940s, I imagine that the Council Oak name was actually probably more prominent than the uh, Tollerton and Warfield name because uh, of the, the proliferation of the stores uh, throughout the Sioux City area. Here we have another uh, Council Oak store that was out in the Riverside area of Sioux City on the western edge of Sioux City. So this is 5315 Military Road uh, and this is at this is at the corner of uh, Military Road and Holm Street, uh, and if you know where Harvey's Restaurant is today, this would be this this building uh, occupied uh, basically the, the the parking lot that's on the to the northwest of, of the Harvey's Restaurant uh, as it sits today, but has been demolished. Here we have a, a Council Oak store that was out on at twenty three twenty nine West Second Street, uh, and so. This building is a uh, one of the Sarge Mini Marts uh, today. Here we have a, a, a Council Oak store in South Sioux City at 2205 Dakota Avenue. Uh, today it's uh, occupied by Maria Supermarket. So this is a, a, a one of the uh, buildings that's still being used today. Even in basically, uh, it's still being used in the grocery business as well. Uh, in in the 1930s, uh, the Council Oak store moved into this building at 1920 Pierce Street. So this would be the southeast corner of 20th and Pierce Streets. Uh, today, it's occupied by Davenport Cleaners. And here we have the uh, Leeds Council Oak store. Uh, this uh, this is a 3907 uh, Floyd Boulevard, and uh, we. We have uh, it, it today. It still is in existence today. It's uh, so it'd be the it'd be the northeast corner, I think, of uh, of Forty uh, First Street and uh, um, and Floyd Boulevard. Uh, today, it's occupied by computer revamp on the on the uh, left section of the building and bulky drafting company on the on the right section of the building. Here we have one of the newer Council Oak stores. Kind of one of so after World War II, the Council Oak stores had been kind of the the traditional mom and pop type uh, grocery stores that were spread out or around the, in the neighborhoods and in the of Sioux City and in the small towns. But after World War II, they became much more like the modern supermarkets uh, uh, that that we know today and that we think of as grocery stores. Uh, and this is one of the newer ones uh, that was built after World War II at 1415 Villa Avenue. Uh, today, this is uh, the, the Salvation Army Corps uh, Community Center out on, on Villa, so on, on Sioux City's west side. In, in 1952, Tollerton and Warfield uh, built a, a new, modern, post-World War II uh, warehouse 
out on uh, Highway 75 North and 28th Street. So this is at the southeast corner of 28th Street and uh, U.S. Highway uh, 75. Uh, and this was overseen by company president Thomas Grinberg. Uh, Grinberg was a, 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 an immigrant from Norway uh, who became, began his career at Tollerton and Stetson as an office boy in 1899 after his father had died. Uh, and it, he worked his way up through the company, became company president in 1938 and, and held that title until he retired in 1957. Uh, in 1956, the, the National Tea Company, which was a, a, a very large uh, uh, national firm based in, in Chicago, acquired majority interest in Tollerton and Warfield and the Council Oak stores uh, and then took control of it. And so from that point on, Tollerton and Warfield was, was no longer locally owned and controlled. Here we have a picture of the inside of the, of the new warehouse. And so, of course, it, this is uh, um, uh, you know, much more modern building metal construction, uh, so you no longer have the heavy uh, wood frame construction of the older warehouses. Uh, now, the National T used the Tollerton and Warfield Council Oak uh, names until 1960 uh, when they changed them to the National Food Stores of Iowa, and so then the Council Oaks became National Stores, they were called. Uh, I do want to mention that the, this uh, warehouse today is, the, is used by the Palmer Candy Company as their uh, warehouse and distribution center. Here we have a picture of one of the national food stores. This is the one in, in Leeds, uh, which was built in, in uh, 1966, uh, and today is the Dollar General store in, in Leeds. And so National Foods uh, operated in the Sioux City area from 1960 until 1973. Here's one another one of the National stores that was up on Pier Street, 2614 Pier Street. Uh, this has been uh, demolished since uh, and is it's the, kind of the parking area that's at the, it'd be the southeast corner of 27th and Pier Streets and just to the south of Uni, Unity Point Hospital. Another Tollerton and Warfield uh, connected business was the Rob Ross Company. Uh, Rob Ross began as an expansion of Tollerton and Warfield's uh, food manufacturing business, uh, and it, it was named after Tollerton and Warfield food scientists Rob Countermine and Ross Grange, uh, but eventually uh, split off into its own uh, into its own business. Uh, the first location for Rob Ross was at 304 Wall Street. Uh, which was a, a building that occupied the is the site. Uh, it's basically just to the um, would be just across the to the east of the uh, Floyd Boulevard viaduct uh, from the building we're looking at in, in this photo, uh, which was uh, and it, it, the site is occupied by uh, Bremen Paper today. Uh, not sure that I don't think uh, Rob Ross actually used the Bremen Paper Building. I think that was built after Rob Ross moved out of a structure that was there earlier. Uh, but in 1926, uh, Rob Ross moved into the the former William Tackaberry uh, Warehouse at uh, um, at Third and, and Wall on the on the west side of the the uh, Floyd Boulevard Viaduct. Uh, and that's that's what we're looking at today. Only this time, in an earlier view, we were looking from the the south side along Third Street. This time, we're looking uh, from the north. Uh, to, so we're looking to the the north side of the of the building. Uh, and Rob Ross uh, manufactured and packaged all kinds of products, but but coffee was a, a big big one. We have Rob Rob a picture of Rob Ross uh, branded coffee. Uh, they also did things like uh, peanut butter and uh, pancake syrup and uh, uh, just a, a whole litany of, of products. Uh, in 1957, Rob Ross was purchased by an investment firm based in Minneapolis, but the Rob Ross name was used until uh, the, the business was closed in 1974. And then now we move on to uh, the... the the uh, Howell and Warfield Company. Uh, this was founded in 1892 uh, by David Howell, William Warfield Sr., and William Warfield Jr. Uh, so this is where the Warfields come back into, into the story. 
Uh, now, William, the Warfields came from Quincy, Illinois, and, and as I said before, uh, William Warfield Sr. remained in Quincy for the remainder of his life. Uh, William Warfield Jr., though, moved to Sioux City and became prominent in, in Sioux City business circles. Uh, David Howell uh, seems to have uh, lived in Sioux City for a time, but eventually uh, moved back to, to Quincy, Illinois himself. Uh, their original uh, warehouse building was at uh, was at uh, 300, 302 Pearl Street. So it's the, it's the two-story building being with the white arrow pointing down toward it. So this would be the uh, northeast corner of, uh, of 3rd and, and Pearl Streets is where this was. And it, it kind of uh, was surrounded by the Hornig Hess and Moore Wholesale Drug Company, uh, which was an L-shaped building that, that surrounded it. Now, the, the business... Uh, Expanded in 1898. Uh, in, in 1898, uh, a Des Moines businessman who was in the paper business, uh, William Pratt, uh, purchased an interest in, in uh, the Howell and Warfield uh, business, and it became known as Warfield Pratt and Howell, and they moved into a larger warehouse. They uh, moved into uh, a building that had been built by William Higman, that we heard his name earlier, um, in connection with the Shankberg business. Uh, William Higman, after he left the wholesale grocery business, had built the, the building we see here at 313, 315 uh, Nebraska Street. So that would have been on the uh, west side of Nebraska Street between 3rd and 4th, kind of on the north side of the alley uh, in, between, in the middle of that block. Uh, he had built that for a uh, shoe and boot business that he ran in the 1880s uh, and early 1890s. Uh, so Hig or Warfield Pratt and Howell moved in into that uh, structure in, in 1898 and operated there until 1906. Uh, we have a great picture of a of a storage bin uh, here that uh, uh, for Warfield Pratt and Howell's Northwestern brand coffee. And uh, anybody that uh, is too is familiar with the uh, railroad. Uh, business uh, will we'll recognize the Northwestern Railroad logo used on this. So uh, I, I'm not entirely sure how they, they got the rights to use that uh, that brand. I will say their, the warehouse we're going to see here in a moment was right across the street from uh, one of the very large uh, Chicago Northwestern uh, uh, warehouses on the south side of 3rd Street. So possibly they had such a close connection that uh, they were allowed to use that brand or made some sort of deal. But uh, a great uh, a great logo, no matter what. Now here we have, in 1906, Warfield, Pratt & Howell constructed this uh, large warehouse uh, at the northwest corner of, uh, of 3rd and Jennings Street. So this is on the uh, north side of 3rd. And it, if you could see across the street to the south on the, on the left side of this picture, outside of view would be, there was a, a, a very big uh, Chicago Northwestern warehouse so that I'm sure a lot of the products uh, that, that Warfield, Pratt & Howell dealt in uh, you know, received from there. Uh, this building today is the United Center and has uh, been is used by United uh, Realty Company and has also been turned into uh, condos. Here we have a great uh, picture of of uh, the the inside of of the building. Uh, not entirely sure. This possibly was taken during the 1930s when it was was uh, used by the Pratt Mallory Company. But uh, anyhow, you, you get a sense of, again. This is another one of the big, heavy wood framed uh, warehouse buildings, uh, and you, you can see another one of the uh, uh, spiral uh, product slides in the background behind the the workers that you see in the picture. And then finally, uh, we'll finish up with the Pratt Mallory Company. So uh, Lemuel Mallory uh, was born in Wisconsin, and he became a, a, an employee of Howell and Warfield, and then which later became Warfield Pratt and Howell in 1894. And kind of like uh, we saw with Thomas Grinberg, he started at the very lowest level and worked his way up uh, in the business. Uh, in 1925, he purchased a 100% interest in the Sioux City branch of Warfield, Pratt & Howell uh, in partnership with William Pratt's son, Everett Pratt. So Everett Pratt was living in Des Moines, where his family was from. So by 1925, there were actually three Warfield, Pratt & Howell uh, uh, businesses, one here in Sioux City, one in Des Moines, and then one in Quincy, Illinois. And, and so it was, it was the Sioux City uh, branch of the company that... Uh, um, that Mallory and, and Pratt took control of and, and named Pratt Mallory Company. 
Here we have a picture of Pratt Mallory's uh, Royal M brand uh, coffee uh, from around 1930. So and here we have a picture of the uh, uh, of the warehouse at Third and Jennings Streets uh, after it, while it was being used by uh, the Pratt Mallory company. Uh, you can see in this photo a a um, a skywalk had been built. Uh, connecting the Chicago and Northwestern warehouse on the south side of Third Street with the Pratt Mallory warehouse on on the north side, and so that's what, what we're seeing here. Uh, now, uh, Lemuel Mallory passed away in 1931, and the company continued on. But when Everett Pratt died in 1938, the the company went out of business, uh, and the facility then was taken over by Lewis and Ira Kaplan's uh, wholesale grocery business, and used for many years uh, afterwards.